All right, hey, and welcome back, fucking finally, to Well Behaved Women, the podcast yeah. about women in history who were like revolutionary in their time, for better or for worse. Yeah. So this is kind of weird. We have two other co-hosts. They're new people joining our team. I'll let them introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Hannah. I responded to your post within five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> I luckily was on the Reddit page <laughs> right in time to see that post. Um, but if you don't know me, my name is Hannah. I, I've i been a big fan of revolutionary women throughout history for as, as long as I can remember. Amelia Earhart being probably my number one peak role model. So I'm very, very happy, very, very excited to be here. Woo-hoo. Thank you. Awesome. And who else do we have? Uh, my name is B. Uh, Lauren and I met at a trade show uh, where we were working booths that just happened to be across the aisle from each other and just kind of struck up a conversation. Uh, you had a really weird hat. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I want to see who is wearing that weird hat. Who is he? Yeah. Uh, I had, had one of my hats on, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a DJ, which is the reason, well, have been a DJ. It's not the only thing that I am. Um, but... It's the reason why I was there, and we started talking about podcasting, and it's always something I've been interested in, um, and as somebody who's on a microphone in front of people all the time, speaking is comes natural to me. It sounded really fun. I'm a big fan of women and history. Yay! And, uh, yeah, it sounds like a cool ride. Mm. There are many cool rides to be had in women's history. For sure. For sure. And I am so, so excited to be starting this up again. Um, so... Pandemic was not kind to everyone's lives, Mm -hmm. and so some changes happened, and uh, for her own personal reasons, Kyria is not going to be joining us in the show anymore. She's fucking awesome, and I love her to death, but, you know, yeah, she's got her own stuff going on, which is fine. So I'm here with Hannah and B, and we are going to be talking about crazy, crazy women. Yes. I want the crazier, the better. Give me those women who just did not give two shits or one shit. So for now, um, we're going to kind of redo an episode that I did with Kyria. And I thought it would be really fun to kind of introduce back this concept uh, through retelling one of these stories. All right. So on this year in history, I'm going to guess what year this is. Sure. The Great Molasses Flood oozes through Boston, killing 33 and leaving 150 more injured. Gives me an idea. All right. The German Workers' Party is formed, becoming the predecessor to the more widely known German group, the Nazi Party. Uh, okay. Okay. We're in the 30s, 1930s. An anarchist uprising in Buenos Aires, known as Tragic Week, claimed over a hundred lives. Oh. And the Seattle general strike happens and lasts five whole days before troops break it up. Okay. I'm going to guess this is 1936. I would guess the earlier 1900s, maybe like 1901 or as at most 10 would be my Okay, guess. so you're thinking the first decade of the More new... turn of the century. Okay, your yeah, turn yeah. of the century, I'm going right before World War II. All right, so you're both wrong. Oh, Sweet. shoot. Love that. Fantastic. Cool. <laughs> oh, Nam. Rumor has it the year was 1919. Oh, okay, wait, so I should know this. It's really, really yeah. a middle, we weren't as far <laughs> middle ground. Your, I should know the year, though. Your response made me believe I was much further off. Than a, <laughs> Price is right, rules, I still win. Yeah, you, you do, do you, win. You, you do under. win. I overshot it. And round one goes to B. Okay, round one to B. I, I respect. It's not a competition. I know, but still, respect. Juan Duarte was a wealthy rancher in a town called Chivilcoy, Argentina. Mm-hmm. He had a family and children that lived there. But at that time, it was not uncommon for wealthy men to take lovers or even have multiple families. Still not uncommon. Yeah. Well, I don't know about the multiple families things, but... Oh, still the lovers now. part. With cell phones and social media, it's a lot harder, I think. I have to have a second family? Yeah. Yeah, probably. It's a lot more fodder for, like, those really cringe videos where, like, the, you know, the cheat, the that jousted lover... Yeah, like, you could gets, have a second family. You know, family. comes in and is like, I you're the it. other family. <laughs> yeah, I knew, I knew, I knew it the whole here. time. Mari Povich shows up, and <laughs> that determined... Fight, fight, You are fight, the father. Fight, fight, Yeah, Jerry Springer's in the back going... Yeah, having two families is either really trashy or like you're a celebrity like Nick Cannon. Like, oh. Yeah, he like famously has a bunch of children with a bunch of women That's and correct. he's yeah. all about that life. Yeah, for sure. Now Which he has fine. to keep working. 
Yeah, he can't. He can't, can't stop go now. now. Yeah, you had a he way to retirement. Life. Yeah, he did. I don't he chose by not, you know. And you don't exactly go into a relationship with Nick Cannon without understanding, like, exactly what he's about. Well, not now. That's fair. True. Not now. No, no. Now, now it's like, Nick Cannon, you cross the road. Because, not, just because you don't want to get pregnant. <laughs> that, okay. I absolutely, he believed he could get, like, most people <laughs> He just pregnant, looks just at like, you, and it's just like, boom, oh, God, I don't want. Three months along. Give me dinner first. <laughs> so Hannah has a thing for Nick Cannon. That's what <laughs> Love that. Trouble. I had a huge crush on him as a kid, I get though. It. yeah. Well, he nice. was cool on, like, you know, Nickelodeon, Nickelodeon when he was kid, doing yeah, his thing. for sure. Uh, no, he's probably still cool. Anyway, he's probably still cool. Yeah, he's probably a nice guy. I would imagine, like, the family barbecues, though, like, are either really fucking amazing or really awkward. I hear... Really, really awkward. I hear the mothers of his children get along fairly well. Good. As far as I've read. I, you know... Yeah. He's just one of those people that's too easy to, like, impersonate. That's fair. Mm. He just has one of those voices that's just, like... It's, uh... (laughs) Yeah, you can make a parody from it. <laughs> yes, it, mm-hmm. it's very like, I guess Chris Rock is like the most, per, the, like the closest like person I could resemble it to. Gotcha. Maybe, Which yeah, like, it's Chicago. You know I mean? mm-hmm. There's a very uh, the energy behind his phrasing. Yeah. It's almost like uh, on a beat. Yeah, there's almost. something very particular. Yeah, about he's it. Re- yeah, it's it's I think it's his. You know, he's been on Nickelodeon since how old was he? Probably, so he's very rehearsed in the way that he answers things. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Fun. He's been on we camera his Nick- whole life. Right. So this we one guy, this wealthy, one guy, wealth, wealthy rancher, he started hooking up with a seamstress named Juana Ibargu- Ibarguren. I'm mm-hmm. gonna pr- mispronounce some of these names, so forgive me. Uh, she lived in Hunin, which was nearby, and she had five children, okay. all with him. She had Juan Ramon, Erminda, Elisa, Blanca, and Eva, who was born May 7th, 1919. All right. Juan abandoned Juana for good when Eva was only a year old. Nice. Oh. Same. (laughs) I was hoping this would go somewhere nice. No. 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 If it's a good history story, usually that doesn't happen in the beginning. Uh, He returned to live with his legal family. Oh, all right. Well... (laughs) I guess I can't get mad at that. Okay, but but what about <laughs> what about this? What about this? As a parting gift, he had a document drawn up declaring all of Juana's children legal, oh. which allowed them to use the Duarte name, which was big okay. at the time. Okay. Right. So like good. What for about kids? what so, about that? What if he did that? What a nobleman. <laughs> I, I don't it know. Fixes things, what if right? he ruins the I mean, name though? I feel it, like he's going to tank things. that name. <laughs> it does something. Uh oh. Whatever it does, it's not going to do shit to put. Food on the table. No, it like doesn't sound like your it. bills. It's just a name, right? It's just a name right now. So Juana moved her five children and herself into a one-bedroom apartment in Hunin's most poverty-stricken area, which is called Los Toldos. And even with the piece of paper declaring their legal status, the simple fact was they were bastards and everyone treated them like that. Yeah, that kind of... Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Juana worked as a seamstress and a cook and lived with the stigma that most women get when they have five children and no man to show for it. Oh, so they called her a whore. They, yeah. They just considered Definitely her damaged. Her promiscuous. Yeah, like damaged goods. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah, it was great. But Damn. Juan died suddenly when Ava was six. And oh. after there was a scene at the church between the women, Juana and her children were allowed to pay their respects, but only okay. briefly. And then they were escorted right out of the church. They're people. They're, they Why got to pay their respects. Not, yeah, but you ushered them right out of there. They got Everybody... to say goodbye. You know what? That's not enough. Sounds like they're better off. They're better off without, I'm sure, but the family could at least treat them with some dignity, but maybe I'm just being optimistic. I think you're being optimistic. It might be the problem here. Yeah. Okay. Your your innocent little heart let's has not optis- yet been let's take this optimism hat off. by the reality of history. Yeah. Okay. No, don't, don't change who you are. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I will keep dreaming. <laughs> Okay. So Ava had a flair for the dramatic. She loved the cinema, and through community events, Ava discovered that she loved to act. At age 13, she was in a production of Arriba Estudiantes, and her dream of being a famous actress someday solidified in her brain like dried cement. And the best city for that at the time was the nation's capital, which was Buenos Aires. Mm. Everyone in her small town who had been to the Big Apple of Argentina... I was just thinking, I was just going to make that example. Yeah. It's going to be like going in from Iowa to the big city and... Yeah. Yeah. It really is. Oh, God. Oh, no. And and everyone who had been there kind of, like, had the same starstruck, like, oh, it's the best 
and it was a marvelous place where, quote, nothing was given but wealth. Uh-huh. So everyone was going to be rich when you got there. Sure. Everyone. Everybody's going to be so If you show rich, up, you'll be rich. You'll be the wealthiest person ever. Okay, I believe it. Sure. And Ava was really poor. Her family had come from nothing, and she didn't have a father anymore, and there was very little chance for a girl like her to make it in the real world. So mm-hmm. she planned instead to... Uh, so her mom instead planned to marry her off to, like, one of the local bachelors. Oh, shit. Yeah. Like, you can be this guy's problem. No. I love how how parents could do that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm tired of caring for you. Please, you, take her. But also, like, you seem like you need a man to, you know, run your life for you. Well, yeah, women were considered a burden. That's why they had dowries. So, oh, no. Did they put a dowry out for her? Um, well, Doubtful. when when she was 15, she left. Oh, okay. So she went to Buenos Aires, but there... Escape. <laughs> Escape. Well, they're differing stories. Mm-hmm. So, one, she ran off with a young musician in a whirlwind and very short-lived love affair. Sure. Two, her mom accompanied her for an audition and arranged for her housing with family friends. Or three, and my favorite, because I love Broadway, Agustin Magaldi. Um, most people actually discredit this story because there is a no record of this guy traveling to Hunan in 1934 and B he usually traveled with his wife when he actually went. Anywhere. Who is this guy? So this guy, have you ever seen the play of Vita? Oh yes. I was wondering if this is from on this night of a thousand stars. That guy. Uh, the one who uh, fucks her and then is like, ah, okay, I'll later. take you with me. Never mind. And she's like, no, I'm getting on this fucking train with you. Like, that that was the deal. He yep. said, save That's... the drama for your mama. I don't want your feelings. <laughs> yeah. Oof, the... Who has the distinction of being the first man to be abused? Oh, you know the to word. To have a Duarte. Ooh. It's... Oh, it's a fucking amazing no, play. No, I you actually like it in a watch long it, time. You're like, holy shit, I'm like, go I've labor. Always... Go labor. It's awesome. I feel like I'm watching a play right now. <laughs> yeah, I know. You're like performing it. No, never going to do that again. No? Oh, no. all right. That was it. Yep, that's it. So. Long live flavor. Yeah. <laughs> Long live flavor. <laughs> so however she ended up getting there, Ava Duarte had arrived in 1934 and she was ready to take Buenos Aires by storm. She dyed her naturally black hair blonde and then kept it that way for the rest of her life. Ouch for that hair. Because you know they weren't doing anything safe with it back Mm-mm. then. Uh-uh. You're just burning the shit out of it. I'm going to ask, remind me to ask later, when she dies, does she have hair? Mm-hmm. I want to ask. It's probably a wig. Okay. All right. Sorry. <laughs> Her theatrical debut came in March 1935 in a play called La Señora de Perez. The next year, she toured around Argentina with a theater company, began work as a model, and was cast in B-grade movies. Hmm. Though she was beginning to be successful, she was still living hand-to-mouth. She lived in the tenements of Buenos Aires and was known for her ravenous appetite at social events. It was obvious to everyone she was hungry, like, all the time. Oh, that's not what you want to be known for. She was, like, the person that showed up to the party for the buffet. Oh, I mean, it's and related back. back. And I was back. just going to say, well, like, on the buffet. that's my True. whole, is there food at this function? Then I'll go. Yes. If I'm going to get yeah. fed, I'm going to be there. I have done that. I can't say I haven't done that. But, like, you don't it's, want to be known for it. No, but it's one of the we best perks. We say surrounded by food. I did bring <laughs> snacks. I did bring snacks. And it's one of the best perks about being a wedding DJ. You always mm. get fed. Good stuff, too. Free steak dinners every weekend. Yeah, Bro, it's, so it's crazy. Love that. So, in 1942, Ava landed a part in a daily radio show called Muy Bien. The most important... <laughs> Bless <laughs> Sorry, I took a... The most important <laughs> match. <laughs> Take a hit of my vape, and then all of a sudden had to really sneeze. Vapes give me the sneezes, too. I get it. Do they really? I they do. Um, so it was called Radio El Mundo, and Ava was on it. It was, like, the most important thing in the nation. An important radio station in the country. She didn't stay on it for long, as later that year she signed with Radio Belgrano, mm-hmm. which was another important station in the city. They were kind of competitors. Okay. In signing, she was guaranteed an acting spot on a show called Grandes Mujeres de la Historia, or Great Women of History. She played women like Elizabeth I of England, mm. Alexandra Fyodorina of Russia, and Sarah Bernhardt. Can you, can you imagine a, <laughs> a Latina queen of England? <laughs> <laughs> It'd that's be very a, fun. That's fucking crazy. That's awesome. No. <laughs> no. Oh. 
Uh, we all saw be... how it happened with the black chick. Like, you don't want to send anybody else. That's no, like what Disney's there. doing now. We're like re we're recoloring all of like recasting. <laughs> you know, all the old. Oh movies. yeah, yeah, yeah. But this was a hundred fucking years ago. That's hilarious. Yeah, they were doing it. Way to yeah. be ahead of the curve, babe. <laughs> <laughs> By the next year, Ava was earning five to six thousand pesos a month, making Ooh. her one of the highest paid radio Sheesh. actresses in the nation. Nice. So she was not actually living hand to mouth anymore, which yeah. is like the dream for everyone. Right? Yeah, doing it. She's just already turned it around. She's living Damn the right. dream. Someday we'll find it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I will find that somewhere. She was not outstanding or even very popular among her co-stars, but was known for her dependability. Okay. She would always show up because of she her hard works. work. Oh, she worked. She worked. And because of that, she was able to move from the tenements into a very exclusive neighborhood called Recoleta. She had a short film career, but none of the productions she was part of ever really had much success. But during that time, all of these time that's passing, Mm -hmm. she's dating all these different men. Okay. Who, like, might be connected here and and might be connected there. And what do you know? Like, the next social ladder. Uh, Yeah, she's climbing the social ladder, and she's able to kind of get all of these cool different positions. And you can see this, like comet like stride you know yeah, yeah, yeah. increase in shooting up mm-hmm. yeah yeah astronomical gains basically nice. is what I'm saying, to her career she's smart. and every single time she's dating a different guy a it doesn't really last star. long but like yeah right and people just kind of didn't love that a jelly <laughs> well yeah they are i think either that or they're just like oh you're a woman you shouldn't be doing this well that's usually again just a product of jealousy yeah. uh, you know yeah, could the first be. people to call horror are the ones that are like upset that they didn't. Uh, yeah, we're just projecting. Uh-huh. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Oop! News bulletin. News bulletin. Actually, oh, we're going to back up a little. <laughs> All right. So we're going to so give we a little it. bit of background on what was happening around the world. So okay. elsewhere in the world, when she was growing up, mm-hmm. as especially like how it affected the Argentine. So around this time that she was born, civil unrest was starting to peak its little head around the corner. Radicals in Argentina started this secret male suffrage. Mm. Yeah, okay. Men's rights for everyone. For every man or everyone. <laughs> Which allowed native-born males the right to vote. Oh, yay, they get to vote. Yep. Out of a population at that time of 7.5 million, 745,000 of those people were allowed to vote. That's a lot of people for 1930 or whatever. Damn it. Yeah, mm. but it still was not even close to being representative of their, their mm-hmm. population. That's wild, though. And of those 745,000, 400,000 abstained from voting at all. What? They didn't even use it? It's my kind of people. Oh, if I could canvas So that's then. why when people say get out the vote, you get out the fucking vote. My mom, this happens. love her. She got me to start canvassing when I was in high school, so I'm still active. Awesome. Good. We're not can't be. There's a lot of uh, local government in my family. Oh, yeah? Yeah, like my mom's brother was the mayor of our town for like 20 years. My aunt's husband is the mayor of their town and has been for like 15 years. Oh, wow. But my, yeah, before I was born, my like dad's godfather was the mayor of their town for like, it, it's wild, dude. That is legacy. It, don't say that word. Yeah, like you can't uh, own the town. <laughs> oh, no. Okay, does, maybe don't say apply. that word. I'm not doesn't using apply. That. I'm not using that for nothing. <laughs> no, 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 no. So at one point, because of these, you know, this very small voting pool, uh, that led to a lot of men who got into office and started leaning towards fascism. Oh, Sweet. yeah. Fascism. Love, love that for them. Yeah, it's fantastic. Which explains why the Nazis went there afterwards. Nice. Yeah. So at one point, there were three big wings causing political unrest in the country. There was the militaristic conservative party Mm -hmm. that still had control over the government. Mm -hmm. There was the right-wing radicals who basically rigged the elections. And then there were the left-wing anarchists, devastating depression, uh, like bombing everything to just shit. The moral of the story, kids, is that everybody's corrupt. Everybody of government. (laughs) Every level We haven't figured it out yet. (laughs) And I'm going to tell you this little secret. We never will. We never will. Uh, yeah. As long as capitalism exists, this is going to stay fucked. It's not going to get figured out while we're mm-hmm. alive. I'm going to tell you that. No, right. not at all. So this was all in a, the midst of a fantastically devastating depression that hit Argentina just as hard as oh. it hit the states at that point. Oh, so it makes everything, like the stakes are so much higher. Yeah, it's yes. horrible. So all of this political unrest caused like yeah. a bunch of fraudulent elections World and corrupt leaders. Shit up. 
yeah. Oh, yeah. And and the snakes, the true snakes of society, were really able to kind of slither in well, there yeah, and, as... and, like, latch themselves into, I'm going to be a politician here, and yeah. I can just worm my way into this by, mm-hmm. you know, maybe moving into a new district for, like, f- 45 days before an election so that yeah. I can be the representative. And yeah. It's all vote, loopholes you know, and manipulation. Whatever. But ultimately, like, that's why World War Two was so, like, devastating and how it got started so quickly because people hadn't even recovered from World War One. Yeah. yeah. It's fucking horrible. Peter Baelish said it best. Chaos is a ladder for some people. For sure. Yeah. That's a bitch right there. <laughs> that's a little whiny bitch. It's horrible. Yeah. So... All of this shit is kind of boiling over the pot. And so finally in June of 1943, there was a military coup and there was a this group called the GOU or the United Officers Group that was all behind it. Mm-hmm. They sought and ultimately succeeded in unseating the president who was elected fraudulently and their political group began making changes to the nation. Basically, we love a coup. Good, good we're change. in charge now, so we're going to change things. We love a good coup. Yeah, but, like, what kind of changes were they making? I think we'll talk about it. Alrighty. <laughs> so, one of the high-ranking officers in the GOU was a soldier named Juan Peron. Okay. He had spent time traveling Europe in the midst of World War II and had socialist ideals to bring back with him. Okay. He turned the de- Department of Labor office he held into something a lot more than a title. He worked with the labor unions, having had a history of acting as a mediator in labor disputes and was well-liked in that community. Nice. These are all good signs. In January 1944, an earthquake decimated the town of San Juan. And when I say decimated, I mean that literally. Like, 10% of everything was destroyed. Yeah. They all 10,000 10, people died, <gasps> which made up 10% of the population at that time. That's a lot for Oh, my God. It's huge. And so, and because of poor construction standards at the time, over 90% of the buildings were destroyed in the quake, and most that survived were so damaged they had to be demolished as well. It's kind of like what's happening in Turkey right now. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, God. Over a third of the population became homeless. Oh. But Juan Peron reacted quickly to this event, helping victims and organizing this really big gala event to fundraise for the rebuilding of the city. It was the first ever large-scale state-directed construction project, mm. and for months a thermometer hung from the Buenos Aires obelisk, which hangs in downtown, mm. tracking the progress of where their funds were at. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, to make sure that they could rebuild this town. And it was during this fundraising gala that Juan met and immediately gravitated towards an actress named... Ava. Huh. Hey. They left the party around 2 a.m. Woo! Shutting down the bar. Yeah. Shutting down the bar. And... Shutting down the gala. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as one does. They have a whole song about it where they're like, oh, I that. normally don't do this kind of thing. Oh, but, bullshit. You know, I'm just going to go home with you because I can't, I can't help it. How attracted I am to you. What's the opposite? But both of them are doing that. What's the opposite of baby? It's cold outside. That's what this is. Baby, it's too hot in here. We gotta get out. (laughs) Yeah, baby, it's real warm in here. Um, (laughs) So she became his butt lover basically immediately, invited herself into his home, and evicted his former mistress. Oh, shit. Okay, bye. Get out, bitch. Yeah. Yeah. God, like, immediately? You gone. New mommy, let's go. You out. Yeah. Well, fuck, I kind of want to hear her story now. (laughs) Right? I want it all. I want all the tea. (laughs) I need to know. So Ava herself would later refer to the day she met Peron as a marvelous day. Well, yeah. Because obviously they liked each other. Well, Sounds yeah. romantic as fuck. You meet a, you know, high-ranking <laughs> official, sure. Though she was 24. And he was. And he was 48. Whoa! The couple were popular and very well liked. Okay. So Sounds like today. I don't, I mean, like. Yeah, and not, a lot of things sound very familiar yeah. to what's going on here. Yeah. But yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> She's 24, you know. She's yeah. almost twenty five. She's through her twenties. She can she can do she the things she, she can make wants. decisions her for herself. Her prefrontal cortex is basically formed. It, she it's can make her own decisions. There. She can rent a car without extra insurance. Almost <laughs> twenty five. Damn it. Mm. Although okay. Argentina, I don't know what their age for that is, but probably less. Mm. So uh, here's some trivia for you. Did you know I was told this when I was in high school? Uh, that a lot of foreign exchange students come to the United States because it's so much easier to get a driver's license that you could then just apply for an international license after that. No. Whoa. What? Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. That explains so, so much. Isn't that wild? That's crazy. So, so, so much. Huh. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. 
I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> I don't know well, how you, I feel. Look around you the next time you're driving. There's so many dumb dicks driving on the road. I mean, like, like it, it just shows. you don't want to okay, learn here. So I went to uh, Utah for my nephew's first birthday, mm-hmm. and oh, I yeah. had to. I was there in college and I had to like relearn how to drive in Utah and immediately it was like all shields are up I'm on the offensive Ugh. like I've got all of my you know corners covered so I can just zip through because otherwise I'm gonna get run down by an angry like Karen in the back with yeah. four kids and like, an angry Mormon oh Look my out. god the angry Mormon it's horrible and like I didn't realize this but apparently there's been like this influx of Southern Californians into Utah nice. oh yeah so worsening an already bad driving yeah, demographic with find... Southern Utah with Southern California drivers who don't know how to drive in the ice or the snow well no the, they the don't. truth of the matter is, is that because our standards are so low nobody really knows how to drive Unless you're a professional driver. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's just the reality. Mm-hmm. But also, if they're coming from Southern California, they're buying 10 times the property in yep. Southern Utah. I mean, that's... Mm-hmm. They're the, who do you think is living in these multi-million dollar homes? Well, I know. Exactly. Yeah. But I have a friend in Salt Lake. Shout out, Z. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any friends in, in Utah, but go Moab. <laughs> I don't Fuck know. Yeah. I like Moab. Moab. Yeah. Hi, Utah. Hi, Utah. What's up, Utah? If you guys ever go there, if you know, just for fun, go to this place called Ruby Snap Cookies. I literally Ooh, mailed myself cookies back home, like back to the springs, so that I oh. could like have these cookies days later. Okay, how do they compare to the crumble cookies? Because now I want a crumble <laughs> cookie. Don't get me okay, on crumble. I was sitting next to this librarian on the flight in, and I was complaining about the fucking luggage tags, which don't ever, ever, ever and fly frontier. It's fucking horrible. To me, I've already fly frontier. I know. It was a fun conversation. It sounds like a, it sounds like a, like a. It's the like beginning of a joke. Two guys walk into a bar. That's yep. what it sounds like. A librarian and an archaeologist are sitting on a plane, <laughs> complaining <laughs> about the price of luggage. What the hell? So she was like visiting. Um, her sister in you know they were a meeting in salt lake and so they were there for like a few days and so i'm like okay get out your little notebook and so i gave her a few different places to try and i was like whatever you do you gotta go to this place and get the peanut butter burger and you gotta go to this place and get like ruby snap cookies I, just go to ruby snap just trust me the peanut butter and on a burger is a hidden hack that's it's fucking that's amazing really not it's, bad it's, it's oh else. god it's so good so I end up running into her on the, like, flight back. We're mm-hmm. on the same flight back. Oh, and cool. so I said hi, and I was like, did you get to go to Ruby Snap? And she goes, no, we went to Crumble. And I was like, ah. Uh. And I literally, like, went into my luggage. Uh. I had, like, had two cookies left, and I was like, I can sacrifice them for this. Uh. You will learn your lesson. <laughs> like, that's sweet you, of you. you I would have just been like, oh, that sucks for you. Yeah. <laughs> and I would have just kept them. <laughs> Man, I hate to be they're right very now. good. Yeah. They're, they're normal sized cookies, so it doesn't take like mm-hmm. 15 bites to eat them, and they're not topped with a bunch of stuff. Yeah. It's like a lot of the things that they're, you know, that they have are like in oh, the see, cookie. I'm not interested oh, okay. anymore. You lost me. <laughs> I do love a lot of topping. They also have like plain kind of cookies turkey. with like lots of froth. Oh god, I'm a, we got I'm a this Irish. We got this Irish cream mocha cookie that, that was like awesome. straight up like almost a grocery store like sugar mm-hmm. cookie where oh, it was yeah. nice and soft and yeah. puffy, and then the buttercream frosting and that was like Irish cream. Oh my god, it was so good. Sounds lovely. It was so nice. That sounds so good. I think we need to talk about people. Yeah, yeah we probably Stop do. Stop talking about food. I could always talk about food. <laughs> I want to talk about cookies all day we long. We could definitely <laughs> talk about I will have to make some scotchy cookies. I'll make you guys my avocado chocolate cookies. Ooh, I really want to try that. Ooh, it might be fun. This is, see, this is the gay in me. Uh, <laughs> it might be fun to do themed treats for pots. Like if we, we do, could. That's a really good idea, you Steve. You know what I mean? We <laughs> could. Steve. That's your name. That's right. It's Steve. That's the, that's the Bake Off family. Mm-hmm. Mm. I love that, but we just can't make any like comments about each other's crusts. We gotta be nice, and nothing about just anybody's soggy bottom. <laughs> nobody, nobody wants nobody a soggy bring, bottom. But you don't need to bottom. talk about it either if it's there. Nice. And if it's a good you bake, nice. we gotta get a knife to go. It's a That's a good bake. That's a good crust. <laughs> That's a good crust. Oh, that was so good for that uh, Mary Berry. Yeah, <laughs> she's so fun. I love, oh, her. I love her. I'm gonna watch Bake Off later now, love and her. I'm gonna make my roommate watch Bake Off with me. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. And you know, they're welcome. They that. are. They are very welcome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. Okay. so she's dating El Senor. 
El Senor, who was working in the labor union. And he often actually invited her to um, his cabinet meetings. Mm. Ah. And he would allow her to absorb all of this information that he took in and, like, That's listen to her opinion when she up. gave it. <laughs> like, why? You bring this complete outsider into your cabinet yeah, meetings. Yeah, I'm very like, curious. Why he, why babe, what do you think? <laughs> babe, That's... babe? I, what do you think? Well, he's probably because he's, right yeah, well, he's, probably cause he's sleeping with her. And, oh, fuck yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, hysterical. But why would she want to go? Oh, she's trying to move up the ladder. She's put, Have you not she heard wants her power. Career? No, her, I know she wants power versus, I mean, so far she's been doing Hollywood. The guy was in a she's fucking military the uniform game. at the, at the thing. Like, okay. at the event, he was All in right. his goddamn military. Who would not want to go home that, with, That's like, my optimism. High ranking She wants to see how the game gets played, babe. Okay. She wants to see behind those curtains. How the sausage gets made. That's uh, right. That's what she Hamilton. wants. Okay, all right. <laughs> but because she didn't come from politics, yeah, he really didn't know or didn't care. Like that, women really. He wasn't from he just politics. Didn't... He he wasn't from politics. He didn't have like a whole family that was raised up. It wasn't a generational yeah, yeah, thing. Sure. He was a newcomer. Okay, and so. Greenhorn. He wasn't aware that like women weren't really allowed in the meetings. Like, uh, we don't really bring bitches in here. Doesn't matter. He's if you accidentally care. He was, progressive. He was digmatized. It didn't matter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, true. He just he kind of wanted to create like a second hymn. Like he wanted someone that was going to basically be like his rubber ducky. Mm-hmm. I see. Like I'm going to validate everything you say because I need someone to give me a second opinion on like what I'm already thinking. Yeah, right. I need okay. reciprocation. I need another vote in the room. Yep. Exactly. Mm-hmm. All right. So, in May of 1944, radios were ordered to create a union. And it's it's speculated by some that Juan Perón made the suggestion and that it was to appease him that the newly formed union elected Ava as its president. Okay. So there's a little bit of, like, backdoor stuff there. Nepotism! Just a little bit, yeah. Even in unions. Mm-hmm. She began hosting a daily radio show called Toward a Better Future, and in this show she would tout Juan's policies, play his speeches, and emphasize his importance. And when she spoke, Ava Duarte spoke in ordinary language as a regular woman mm-hmm. who wanted listeners to believe that she that what she herself believed about Juan Perón. Sure, it's the I every see. woman. I'm just a She's nobody, a and if people. I yeah. believe in Juan Perón, if he could love someone like me, if I'm important to him, I'm just a simpleton you're important. like you. Yeah. Yeah. Know. Celebrities pick up their dry cleaning. Damn. I get my dry cleaning. Yeah. We're the same. <laughs> That's very funny. Yeah. So he eventually got promoted to vice president and secretary of war and Sweet. still held his office of labor. So he's juggling all of these things. Way to go, dude. And he <laughs> became this key figure in the new military government and the most irritating as far as the opposition was concerned. All right. Um, with his power, Perón started implementing wage minimums, weekly maximum hour limits, and okay. restricted reasons why employers could terminate their employees. Okay. And made them pay severance and accident compensation. Okay. okay. I, I like everything you just said. Yep. All right. He I'm was basically board. a man of the laborers of Argentina. Nice. In September 1945, Perón delivered a speech that pissed off a lot of people. It stated, we've passed social reforms to make Argentine people proud to live where they live once again. His popularity was more impressive than ever, and his political opponents within the military were terrified of Juan's power. They feared, it, feared his popularity would eclipse that of the sitting president. And ah. because of all of this <clears throat> outspoken support... For the laborers of the world, Mm. he somehow kind of became one of these most powerful figures in the land because he actually went out and met literally a man of the people. He's a man of the people. Mm -hmm. Um, So, in an attempt to kind of halt this and stop his progression, is like, okay, he's a big player now. They arrested him. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yep. Ava wasn't really happy about this. And despite the fantastic scene in the musical where she takes the radio and calls his supporters to rally, Mm -hmm. she, like, is on her daily show and she's singing at this, like, mic and basically, like, we've got to go get him. Like, Mm -hmm. if he, if he can pay attention to me, he can pay attention to you and we've got to go protect this man because he's one of us. Okay. Because I'm a no one. I was a no one. And now I'm an important person. Like, (laughs) yeah, I'm the mistress of the vice president. The mistress. Yeah. (sighs) Jeez. (laughs) <laughs> right. Labor unions around the nation are the real ones to thank for organizing the rally, but she kind of played a part in it. She was able to actually take place in the march, and they marched on the Casa Rosada, which is like the government building. Nice. And she, they demanded the release of Juan Perón, and so at 11 Get p.m., it. their cries were heard, and he was released. Nice. So he stands out on the steps of the Casa Rosada, and he gives a speech on the balcony 
that basically rockets in him to the very forefront of the upcoming presidential election. And then, bang! <laughs> oh, <laughs> I hope not. More shockingly to everyone else at the time was that the next day, he and Ava married. The Whoa. day after he got out of jail, they got married. Nice. Yeah, so, so there was a climax. I just missed it. <laughs> <laughs> it was more of a mar- shotgun wedding. There it is. A little bit. Uh, they were married in a civil ceremony in her hometown of Hunan, and later again in a church ceremony. And despite her reputation and lack of respectable background, Juana, Juan loved Ava and was grateful for her devotion during his arrest. Nice. Two scumbags made for each other. Yeah, cool. pretty much. <laughs> like, we've, we've both kind of come up this far from the nothing that we were, mm-hmm. and we've kind of worked our way, worked the system in yeah. a way that, you know, they understood benefited us. On that le- they, yeah, yeah, exactly. On that level. It was two people of the same kin. Mm. Ken. Whatever. Definitely not of the same kin. Ken. We Ken. Hope, we hope not. Yeah, we really same, hope not. Same vibes. Same, same vibes. vibes. Same vibes. Uh, five trap. <laughs> five trap. Despite her reputation and lack of respectable background, Juan loved Ava and was grateful for her devotion. Shortly after their marriage, her original birth certificate was destroyed. <gasps> oh. Many think it was to hide her actual age from Juan, who now had access to those records. Huh. Oh. Right. She, like, wanted herself to either be just a little, I think, like, a little bit older than she actually was. Now she's a ghost. Peron's political campaign began in earnest, and Ava was at the forefront of the effort. She toured the country with him and spoke highly in favor of his policies on her weekly radio show, which All was right. still going on this whole time. Oh, I love her radio show. I know. Yeah. I want to know, like, how did she start? Like, did she have ad breaks? You know, I want to know. So that... radio was right. mostly ads at that point. Ah. And so she was kind of the, like, intermittent... Thing that it's like reading like, commercials on it. You oh, know, like the, yeah. the Abbott and Costello like comedy hour where mm-hmm. they go in and like basically their little bits are like almost shorter than the commercials. Ah. It's because when TV was invented, it was mostly like for ads. I did a little And you uh, had to do programming work. between it. I did not break. realize it was mostly for ads at that, by the, as far back as it's that. Think of it as like NPR. Like it was all like, uh, there really wasn't music on the radio at this yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk like radio. Mostly yeah. talk radio. Yeah. You're listening to people tell stories. Yeah, That's how exactly. you get, like, all of these, like, uh, like Wild West right, radio hours. They did the Sherlock mm. Holmes, yeah. like, series. Oh, yeah. Kind of, I, yeah. Worked, I worked the graveyard shift at an NPR station at Mizzou. You did. That's I was there. Yeah, and I was That's mostly, cool. I was just queuing tracks and reading commercials. That was it. That Interesting. Was, it was part of my work study. Yeah, it is true. They do read you the commercials on those. That was, that was it. Shows. I was yeah. just reading a prompt. Huh. All right. Do you okay. have to read it in real time? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So basically, you're just waiting for the stories to get over so you can get to your part, and you just... Yep. Just sitting in the chair behind damn. the booth, mm. looking at, you know, all the, the table, the mixer, and everything else that's there, and just okay. waiting for whatever the second... My, usually, my my shift was music, so the okay. classical or jazz music was usually the... Yeah, the jazz. What was playing when was I was there. So there would be, like, at certain, like, minute mark of the hour, you have to read this ad for this sponsor, and it was... Excuse me. It was usually sponsors, like, in, it was a college town, so it was, like, usually local businesses. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, uh, Shakespeare's Pizza was... was Shakespeare's you know, Pizza! Like we... Best. Had Paul Revere's pizza. That's hilarious. Oh my god, we had Paul Revere's pizza, and it was like. What is it about historical names for yeah, pizza places? Yeah, I don't you know, know. You know they're what, gonna smash Little him. Caesars. Larry's Little Caesars. Yeah. <laughs> you want it hot and ready? Yeah, <laughs> I do actually. Yeah, that's all it is. It's hot and it's ready. Yeah, I'm only ever going to hot, to Little Caesars if I cannot wait a half an hour for a pizza. Yep, I can almost always wait. Yeah, I'm exactly. never that hungry. I'm anymore. never that. I'm hungry. never that hungry yeah. anymore. I actually, I finally ever. Yeah, now like, I'm just like I get dough at the store and I'm just making my own shit at yeah, home now. pizza's the best food ever. Oh, yeah. You can do anything with it. And also, like, I've never had a bad piece of pizza. The worst a piece of pizza is ever going to be is okay. I don't know, man. The stuff they served in, like, elementary cafeterias was pretty that's nasty. That's not pizza. That's, like, pizza on French bread. But, you know what I mean? Like, that's... Although, I will say, shout-out to St. Louis, but it's not out of San, It's not a shout-out because Emo's pizza sucks, but it's mm. awful. So, what's the option? I don't know what this place it's is. This. <laughs> It's a St. Louis style pizza. They use like a sweet sauce. What the and fuck yeah. is a St. Louis style pizza? Thank you. That's See, you're horrible. Part, your head's already what the hell? in the right. Who cares what, what a St. Louis fuck? style pizza is? I didn't even know they starters. had one. It's because they want to feel special about yeah. themselves. It's because terrible. Because there's a San Francisco style of pizza. And then there's which is also style terrible. Of pizza. The New York. And there's a New York style of pizza. Detroit has that. St. Louis now. isn't even in the top five styles of talked about pizza styles, but it's terrible. 
Yeah. It's not even in the top five styles talked about of, like, barbecue styles. It's just in so the top the fuck five up, for, Louis. like, murder. It might be close to the... It's probably Kansas clo- City is close. Yeah, then you and have St. Memphis Louis is, and South no. Carolina. Yeah. Yeah, right, for sure. Yeah, it's... Whatever, I hate St. Louis. <laughs> Shout out to my homies that live there. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking listen to us diss on St. Louis every single week. They know, Subscribe. It, it's, it's hard, like, as a Chicago cat, like, I'm already a sports fan, so, like, there's... Mm. It, there's literally, it's born in rivalry. I love so, that. So, like, fuck them. I don't yeah. care. But Southern Illinois, they were all St. Louis Cardinals Yeah, fans. exactly. That was my great-grandmother. Can't stand That was my great-grandma. Like, we got five Cardinals fucking fan. sports teams, and you're rooting for a whole nother... Get out of here. I Go know. back. Go over I there. I know. I grew up basically without a home, so there was never, like, a home team. It was whatever team my parents were cheering for oh, at nice. the time. Like, Relatable. cool, whatever. Yeah. And then I got to be an adult, and I was like, okay, I guess I can have my own favorites now. Yeah. 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 It's not where I'm going to college, and it's not what my parents are fans of, and... Okay, that's cool. Mm-hmm. I can deal with that. Yeah, mm-hmm. this way. Chicago's like culty with sports, though, so it's almost like it I can is... tell. Well, because there's it's split... very culty with sports. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's very split when yeah. it comes to baseball. But it's also like very like fired up. It's just they do get they real feel... fired strong up. feelings either way. Nah, and yeah, it's like I'm not even part you of it. You can't not I have, have an opinion. I have right. a very solid Cubs. You're opinion. not allowed to not care. Yeah, my family. <laughs> it's not an option. Always is. Always will continue to be Cubbies. Yeah, we are the Cubs. See, my family's split. I'm like a black sheep. They're mostly White Sox fans. Mm. Uh, and we grew up on the South Side, so it makes sense. And I was basically a Cubs fan to be a contrarian. See, I was the way that my sports... It was when I, like, I grew up in the Carolinas for elementary school, so I was a Panthers fan. Nice. And just even when we got to like high school, once I got to Chicago, I was a Bears fan. Yeah. And... After that, my parents were always Broncos. So when it came to the 2015 Super Bowl... after that, Super Bowl, it was nothing but heartbreak. I was in, yeah, I was just in full black and blue, and they're all in their orange and blue, and I'm just sitting there for the 2015 Super Bowl just going, come on, guys. <laughs> no, it was bad. No. Bad for me. Good for I mean, them. Hey, then we both lost uh, in the Super Bowls of the Broncos. Oh, who was... Or to Peyton Manning, I should say. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> who was your team? The Bears. I mean, they, oh, lost, the Bears. they lost to Peyton Manning when he was playing for the Colts. Mm. And then, you know, the Panthers lost to yeah, you know, the yeah, Broncos. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. Heard. Damn. Yeah. Ooh, ooh. Anyway. <laughs> Sorry, we went on a tangent. Chicago fans are not allowed to not have opinions. That's, well, yeah. <laughs> Even just then, no. To talk about it is have to some guts. Have to have get an into opinion. It. Stand by it. Yeah, that, that was a whole tangent. <laughs> Take a fucking stand. <laughs> I demand it. I have an opinion about your opinion. <laughs> I have an opinion about your opinion yeah. having on my opinion. Exactly. All right, let's do this. So, he's running for president. Mm, nice. He runs on a pro labor ticket. He mm-hmm. demands. He's aiming for social justice and economic independence. And he wins in a fucking landslide. Nice. Like, people come out in big way for him. Good. And on the tales of World War II at this point, it's 1946. Uh, they're going into the Cold War. His ideas for government largely avoided the issues that would come with siding in that conflict. So, like, mm. they kind of maintained neutrality for a while. And they just wanted to kind of fix their own nation. So, labor strikes at that point had increased from 500,000 lost working days in 1945 to over 2 million in 1946. Damn. And by the next year, it would be $3 million. Damn. Mm. World War II had provided indirect benefits to Argentina. Their yeah. reduction in imports over the last decade and the increase in demand and the cost of their exports had landed Argentina with a whopping $1.7 billion surplus. Hey! And Perón used every penny of it to pay off debts and build infrastructure for the nation. Love that. That sounds like it was so needed at the time, and he listened. After Perón became president, Evita went to work on the fourth floor of the Central Post and Telecommunications Office, where she began to attend to delegations of workers who asked her to intervene in solving labor disputes or helping them obtain better wages. Hmm. All right. Both of you at the same time. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> no, but that's amazing. So she went to work... And wait, let me look at that again. I want to make sure I got that. That was right. Perón. He became president. Oh, he became president. And Evita went to work basically right that, almost that same day and to the telecommunications office. Okay. And she began to attend all these delegations um, and basically became like a stateswoman right the fuck away. That's amazing. Yeah. And she just stepped right into that role with no prior experience. Political power couple. Yeah. Yeah. 
That would make sense. Feminism in politics had never been a thing. Women had been fighting for the ability to vote, but since the Perón arrest, women's suffrage had kind of been put on the back burner. So they had been, like, gaining some steam, but then it was about trying to get Perón out. So they're like, yeah, whatever. Because of his lack of background in politics, as we mentioned earlier, Mm -hmm. Ava had his ear for all of her causes. So, like, the things that were important to her were important to him. And introducing social justice and equality into the national discourse was something that was very important to Ava. Real boyfriend chameleon. That is love. (laughs) All right, it's important to you, it's important to me. I love that. That is love. I want that. He was fucking devoted to her. She was his second wife. It could Uh, be love. It could also be him not having his own personality. Uh, either way no, well, he was really shrewd. use it for he good it, regardless he right? was really shrewd in his own right he had made all of these like um very very correct military choices in offices to pick and like things mm-hmm. to stay out of and and things to like kind of come up on you know he he had his he was like a bernie he had his causes mm-hmm. he was like i'm about labor i'm about getting yeah. like wages and rights for our workers i'm about the working class people mm-hmm. Because rich people are going to be fucking rich no matter what. True. I want them to allow everyone else to have a piece of that pie. Yeah. Um, and was very clear about that. But he had also made these very shrewd military decisions to kind of get him up into that office by the time he already met Ava. So they were both very important in their own right, in their own worlds, separately by the yeah. time they even but met. But he just, like, straight respected her. Yeah. Yeah. He loved that she was, that she had, like... He loved what she was about. He loved the things that were important to her. Yeah. She was obviously really involved. Like, she had a big passion for labor herself because she'd been a starving actress. And, yeah. like, her mom was a very poor working class person who, like, right. just worked way too often, you know, way too yeah. much for way she too She had long. all these experiences from just, like, even from the bottom of just the socioeconomic Exactly. Tearless. She she's been from there all the way up to where they are now, right? And so she has that perspective, I guess. And I think that's crazy. That's a, a, it's really incredible. It is not philanthropy, nor is it charity. It is not even social welfare. To me, it is strict justice. I do nothing but return to the poor what the rest of us owe them, because we have taken it away from them unjustly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That is. It is true. Social welfare. This is justice. You like, know? she's going on the record and, like, doing this where media can this, hear her, and this is, yeah. like, a stated This is black and white issue right here. This is important. Yes. This is not charity. This is what is owed. Yeah. Wow. That would be great to hear from a politician now. Would love that. Bernie. Our government fucked up, our... and even though we weren't the ones who fucked it up, we're going to work hard to make sure that you get mm-hmm. your... You get what's yours. Mm -hmm. You get what you need. We're putting in the work to make things right. And she spoke out prominently for the right to vote. And Mm -hmm. she projected this idea towards like a really wide audience because all of these laborers and their wives who didn't have the right to vote. She's a really white audience? Wide. (laughs) Oh. (laughs) But in Argentina, a lot of it was white. So it's a very white audience as well. why I'm asking. Yeah. (laughs) Just making sure. Yep. White and wide. Um, Wide, white audience. Sounds like me. (laughs) and because she kind of came from nothing and she obviously had this very pro-labor husband like all of these things that would make give her like an opportunity to kind of become popular the public fucking adored her yeah we're like all right cool like you're doing all of these things doesn't matter what your background is in fact you're proud of the fact that you came from nothing Mm -hmm. so fuck yeah you're a lower class bitch like us own it work hard and that's what you're doing fuck yeah we love it so, from her autobiography, My Mission in Life. All right. My Mission in Life. Everything, absolutely everything in our contemporary world has been tailored to the measure of men. We are absent from governments. We are absent from parliaments, from international organizations. We are neither in the Vatican nor the Kremlin. We are not part of the upper echelons of the imperialist countries. We are not in the atomic energy commissions, nor in the great multinational corporations, nor in Freemasonry, nor in any secret societies. We are absent from all the great centers constituting power in the world, and yet we have always been present in the time of suffering, and in all humanity's bitter hours. Man accepts too easily the destruction of another man or of a woman, of an aged person or a child. He does not know what it costs to create them. We do. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. She's just, like, not taking any shit with that one. Yep. Oh, hell yeah. Oh, yeah. 
just in case anyone was a little bit doubtful about what she was about, about yeah. what her goals in life were. Yeah. No, that's that's right there. That is straight a, up. A memoir. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's literally from her autobiography, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that year, law 13,010 was approved unanimously. I don't know why that they numbered them like that. That is an interesting number, It's but a very okay. interesting number. I'll, I'll, I'll refer you to... Law 12,298. Well, no, that, the one you're talking about is 12,934. You miss them. You got those numbers back. Well, yeah, because it's just a bunch of numbers. I doubt they even say 12,000. I bet it's just one, two, zero, you know. Probably, but many. whatever it is. I Yeah. In a public celebration and ceremony, uh, Juan signed the law granting women the right to vote. And then he handed mm-hmm. the bill to Ava, symbolically making it hers. Nice. Yes. Shortly after that happened, Ava created a third political party, which was the Women's Peronist Party. They would go on to have over 500,000 members by 1951. Nice. What was the name again? The Women's Peronist Peronist Party. Ah, Peron- Peronist. Yeah. Peronist? Peronista. Peronista. I mean, okay. Feminista Peronista. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Ah, sweet. All right, she created an entire political party. Yeah, an entire third one. Yeah. And remember, like, at the before all of this happened, the votership was, like, really fucking low. Yeah. And now you've got 500,000 members. Yeah. By 19. We could never. Just yeah. just for the women's party. Like, yeah. Like, not, not for anything else, just in that. So how many more voters are there? Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Which is fucking awesome. And that's not even, like, people that are going to vote against her own. It's like... He's got his own party that's mm-hmm. a majority, and people who love him. And now I'm going to have my own little party that's also for him as a representative. Right. But people can love me, and so they're going to love him. Okay. Uh, so in his first year of presidency, he sent Evita on a trip through Europe that would come to be known as the Rainbow Tour. And although it went well in Spain and France, Eva felt snubbed by the Pope in Italy, and declined, who declined to give her like a, a papal declaration type mm. thing. Um, instead of honoring her with the time allotted for queens and gifted her with a rosary. Okay. So, like, he needed better treatment than the queen, or she needed better treatment than the queen, but she didn't get it. Okay. Why did she need better treatment than the queen? She expected better. Interesting. She okay. wanted more. All right. Better than the queen of England. Come on. Good. Just curious, but all right. <laughs> she's the first lady of Argentina. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, she's really important. So she had plans to meet with King George, but when she learned that she wouldn't receive, King George wouldn't receive her at the palace, and he wouldn't consider their meeting an official meeting of nations, because oh. they they were kind of frosty at each other. Interesting. Um, White people. Yeah. <laughs> she just canceled that whole leg of the trip. Yeah. Um, just due to exhaustion. Like, sure. You know, some, some people say, like, she fell, and she had all of these things, oh, sure. and other people are like... She just got snubbed, and she didn't want to be there anymore. That would probably be me. I'd be like, well, I don't feel welcome now. Her last stop of the Rainbow Tour was Switzerland, and at one point during the day when she was in transit, a rock hit and smashed her car window. Oh. And later that evening, as she sat with a foreign minister, a protester threw tomatoes at them. (gasps) They hit the foreign minister and splattered onto Evita. Ah. And that was, like, the last straw for her, and basically she just like, fuck it, I'm I'm going home. Like, I, I don't need to be here anymore. Yeah, yeah. People are throwing things at me. Well, yeah. These fucking euros. And she's so. she's wearing, this whole time, like, this country is rich. Yeah. And so what do rich women get when they get into positions of power? Furs. Jewelry. Yeah. White clothing. Dresses. Yeah, yeah. dresses. All the couture, all of the ju- fine jewels and all of the big furs and all yeah. of these devi- designer labels. Yeah, yeah. She is in all of these big names and she's, like, basically being paraded around. This is my Argentina Barbie. Uh, around Europe. Here we go. Yeah. Look at how pretty she is. And just mm-hmm. remember how cool we are because look at how pretty our first lady is. How awesome she is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She, we know she's popular. Yeah. yeah. We all love her. We're going to send her to you her, so yeah. that you can love her. She glam. She yeah. glam. She's beautiful. So she returned from Europe because mm, no more. And she was faced with um, more snubs. So there was this organization called La Sociedad de Beneficencia, which was a women... Benefits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm. Beneficiaries or Mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. Um, It was a women's group controlled by 87 elderly women of the upper class dedicated to helping the hungry children of the country. Oh, so I was like, elderly women? Cool. And then you said upper class. And I was like, oh, what kind of help? I bet they're all, like, 
uh, heirs to the like, fortunes is what it sounds like the group is like women who have access to a lot of money. Right. All of the women Maybe. running it are yes. yes okay. Sure. All yes. right. All they right. are all wives of upper class guys okay. and or people that players that are in rich. the government or yeah. their heirs or whatever. Okay. But it's run by all of these women who have buckets of buckets of buckets of buckets of buckets of money. Mm. Okay. And putting it to good use. They're putting it to ideally <laughs> good use. Quote, ideally <laughs> quote. The orphans whose care the Sociedad controlled had to wear blue smocks and have their heads shaved. <laughs> At Christmas, they were put out onto the streets of Buenos no. Aires with collecting tins. No. Uh, no, 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 ladies. It was a very exclusive club, and it had been what? traditionally run by the first lady of Argentina. It's a hard knock life, ladies. <sighs> Why you gotta shave their heads? You know, one hair. Lice, I guess. I, what, if they get, if, I if guess one of the maybe, orphans gets it, all of them are gonna get it. I was gonna it. say That's lice is like the only thing I could think of. I don't fucking know. I don't know. It's because he didn't actually care about poor but people. Where did mm-hmm. it was? It was any... a it was a sham five hundred one c three that they designed to like give goods and services to the lower class of the country, to but they didn't nice. actually do anything it's good for them. <laughs> it's a nonprofit. Oh no. Oh fuck it. It's no. a scam nonprofit. It's not an actual like nonprofit that does I'm so mad at these ladies. Things. Yeah. I'm so pissed. Fucking hate her. I'll throw my AirPods, but I can't because <laughs> I don't have money to replace them. Well, these ladies, they formed a very exclusive club and it had traditionally been run by the first lady of Argentina serving okay. as the president. Um, but because of Interesting. Okay. Because of Evita's age, if you didn't figure this out yet, it's Evita. Yeah, yeah. That's that's his pet that's Juan's pet Wait, name for what? her. <laughs> yeah, that's Juan's pet name for her, and so like that I'll go back and forth between that. Alrighty. Um because of her age, she was, like, too young to be president of the organization, which is fucked up. Nice. Why? Is... Like, it didn't, it probably didn't even have an age thing until... She showed up. Until she showed up. Yeah. And then they were like, well, we gotta put this in. Yeah, we... Whole birds. We gotta, we gotta not nip this in the bud before she starts thinking she could just walk in here. Right. Can't have this young bra. So why did they make this place? age limit, did they say? I, it didn't matter. It didn't Because matter. whatever okay. her age was, it was she was be... just gonna... She was always the whore. She was the whore to them. Yeah. She nice. was the whore that earned her way to a first... Per, like, yeah. to a, the first lady. Mm-hmm. And they you don't fucked your way to the top. And, like, it doesn't matter no. what they were going to say. It doesn't matter how old she was gonna it be. It doesn't matter how, like, you know... It didn't matter about her ideas or what kind of things she's bringing to the table. It didn't matter. They just don't respect game. Okay. So their policies are supposed to have been the inspiration behind the, um, her, Evita's famous declaration that quote, when the rich think about the poor, they have poor ideas. Mm. Mm. But she was first lady. And then that position in the new government held incredible sway. And the way these women thought about the poor was just wrong. And so she crushed her enemies by squeezing all of this financial support away from these women. Ah. Um, if 1947, she was leaving the office each day around 10 p.m. Ooh, late. Her work days got on, like got longer as all the years went by. Oh, In 1948, awesome. she found created the Foundation Eva Peron, and it was its aims were to provide direct monetary assistance and scholarships to gifted children from impoverished backgrounds, to build homes, schools, okay. hospitals, and orphanages in underprivileged areas, and quote. To contribute or collaborate by any possible means to the creation of works tending to satisfy the basic needs for better life of the less privileged classes. Damn. And like, we're going to take extreme steps to see, to make sure that these people are seeing a like actual better life. Yeah. Direct contribution. We're going to stop shaving their heads. We're going to stop shaving their heads. We're not going to shave their heads. They can grow their hair out now. We'll teach them how to braid. Yeah. Stylish up dudes. They could take that and make a career. Boom. So the initial donation of 10,000 pesos came from her own pocket Ooh. because she had, you know, obviously gotten wealthy in her acting. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I was just going to say, as an actress, that's only one movie. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, she was bringing in five to 6,000 pesos a month, like kind of in the middle of her career. So I would imagine it only gets goes up from there. Mm. That's not how active she When is, your act, lead actress is the first lady. You know. Yeah, do you right. think she, is she still filming movies while she's the first lady of Argentina? I don't actually know. I think she kind of stepped away from it when See, she got want. the office, but she did have her radio show for a long time. Oh, I don't yeah. remember. I don't know how long after she got married that did that happen, but for a long time it did. But for a long time she still ran that. Okay. okay. She started very humbly, initially throwing garden parties for all the single mothers in the area. Hmm. And she would also famously take personal under the radar trips to like the ghettos of Buenos Aires while and to hand out all of these aid packages. 
Mm. It had like food and clothing and all that shit in it. Very brave. For every social gathering and political trip she took as first lady, there was always heavily interspersed with visiting the poorest areas where she was. Mm -hmm. So like wherever Peron was given a speech and she was there as first lady, I'm going to make sure that like all of these people are seeing me. Were people recognizing her? I mean, by this point, wasn't she? Oh yeah. She was very famous. Like her, her, her and his images were like plastered on Mm. walls in the city that kind of thing like it's she was very very popular was she ever afraid of like assassination attempts there were some at the point where when they arrested uh peron and she was trying to get him out like there was kind of some conversation about like whether or not they should just go to like exile so that they don't keep getting like fucked around with right you know Mm. oh okay but they didn't go okay all right um macintosh guy got it by the time 1950 rolled around, Foundation Ava Perón looked very different. They managed assets and cash and goods in excess of 3 billion pesos, or over $200 million at the exchange rate of the 1940s. Wow. 1940s, $200 million. Nice. Jeez. What does it, that equate to now? I don't know. Yeah, I don't I know if I want to have an inflation try. Continue. I'll do it. Yeah, yeah. figure it out. It employed 14,000 workers, of whom 6,000 were construction workers and 26 were priests. It purchased and distributed annually 400,000 pairs of shoes, 500,000 sewing machines, and over 200,000 cooking pots. They were able to perform medical checkups on over 300,000 children who desperately needed it. The foundation also gave scholarships, built homes, hospitals, and other charitable institutions. Every aspect of the foundation was under Avita's supervision. And they also built an entire community called Evita City, which still exists today. Oh, it does. And it's actually in, like, the silhouette shape. The city layout is the silhouette shape of her head. Ah. So $200,000 in 1940 equates to... $200 million. Yeah, That's what I meant to say. Sorry. $200 million. That's what I typed in. $200 million in 1940 equates to four and a quarter billion today. With, with a B. Jesus. B-b-b-billion. Ooh. It's a lot of scratch. Holy shit. <clears throat> That's a lot. Though it was unnecessary from a practical standpoint, Evita set aside many hours per day to meet with the poor who requested help from her foundation. During these meetings with the poor, Evita often kissed the poor and allowed them to kiss her. Evita was even witnessed placing her hands in the separated wounds of the sick and poor, touching the leprous, and kissing the syphilitic. Oh. Wow. She showed such compassion. Yeah. That is amazing. Yeah. She was, like, not afraid to touch the people that just didn't get Very Princess Diana. Very Princess Diana. Very, very Diana. The care and attention she paid every single person that lined up outside her door each day, like, just never lingered. It was that every single day. And because of her love and work for the poor and the outspoken support from the Catholic Church, she started to transcend her titles. Mm-hmm. And so she ceased to be Eva Duarte de Peron, First Lady of Argentina, president of this foundation, and she became Santa Evita, which was like Saint Evita. mother of yeah. all the orphans. Uh-huh. Right. Ah. Yeah. So Queen they kind of, of they kind of sainted her like in real I mean, didn't officially do it, but that's what people called her. Right, Santa right. Evita. Oh wow. Madre de todos los niños. Like Mother of all of the children. All, all the children. children. Yeah. Exactly. She was the embodiment of Christianity at work. Uh, poet Jose Marie Castañera de Dios, a man from a very wealthy background, reflected on the times he witnessed Evita meeting with the poor. Quote I had had a sort of literary perception of the people and the poor, and she gave me a Christian one, thus allowing me to become a Christian in the profoundest sense. Basically, like, I kind of thought I knew what poor people were because, like, I'd heard about them. But then she actually went into the streets and I had to meet some of these guys. And so, like, I actually do understand. Like, I know, I can, I've can. i seen yeah. this firsthand now. I know how shitty it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He wasn't paying attention before. Right. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Whoops. It's kind of what it sounded like. All those lessons on Christianity and, like, caring for one another just, like, kind of went silent until I actually saw all those somebody stories. suffering. And then I was like, oh, fuck. All what those, have I done? All those stories of Jesus literally doing all of these things. Washing people's feet. Yeah, like, washing feet. Didn't give feeding you Feeding people. Touching the blind and helping them. If only I'd known sooner to take care of others. Jesus just had a fetish for sick people. <laughs> <laughs> That's another take on it. <laughs> That's why when the lady touched his robes, he was like, oh, I feel a sickness. I gotta turn around and see what's going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is this? What is this? 
One evening in 1950, Ava fainted in public. Three days later, she underwent surgery. Publicly, Ava had had an appendectomy and was recovering slowly, but in private, Ava had been diagnosed with advanced cervical cancer. Oh. Juan was devastated, no. but he knew that it would never matter her it's diagnosis. Over you, babe. Sorry. Pardon? That's so I said, it's hard. over for you, babe. Yep. Only they had a vaccine back then. But because Juan basically knew that it was a death sentence no matter what, he kept it from her, letting belie- letting her believe that she had an appendectomy for a while. Mm. Okay, how do I feel about that? Because it's old school as fuck. Yeah, you don't yeah, talk about but he gets things. the diagnosis, yeah, not right. her. My family's still like that. You don't talk this about was the second wife he'd, he'd had with cancer. So oh, the first shit. wife he had actually died of cancer. And okay. so this was something that was like hitting him all over again. And going, he never oh, so he never got over the first trauma. <laughs> not that yeah. one all over again. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Well, he kind of did. I mean, he really, like, they, by all accounts, like, they really loved each other as a couple. Like, that they doesn't were, mean you get over super, it. Like, yeah. No. He just, he just blocked it out and met another person. Like, he, he him, him he getting the over her Now all that trauma is coming rushing That's back like saying. a big old wave. Him moving on from her death is different from him being affected by her cancer specifically. If it's going to happen again, he's like, why, God? <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> what the fuck? Like, not again. We just went through this. Oof. Right. Peron was about to run for re-election, and Ava, who had been the first woman in Argentine politics to stand behind her husband instead of behind him, mm. uh, she decided there wasn't. He decided there wasn't any reason she couldn't also run for VP. Ah. So the woman's Peronist party was wild for this idea, as were the unions, who saw the Perones as the best thing to happen for their livelihood. That'd be ever. fucking crazy. So yeah, husband is the president, and she's the vice president. Like, yeah, that it. is. Let's go. That is interesting. A dynasty. That's They're really building a dynasty. Yeah. But she was growing weaker by the day, and mm. throughout 1951, she would continue to suffer fainting spells and was bleeding regularly. Oh, no. By August 1951, pressures had reached a boiling point, and they demanded her announcement. Uh, several blocks from the government home, the Casa Rosada, scaffolding had been built up to host a stage and was bordered by portraits of Juan and Eva on either side. Mm. Like, they knew who she was. Mm-hmm. They fucking loved her. Yeah. Um, she was the star of the show. It shocked Juan to see exactly how much the people loved her. But the rally that would be known as the Cab- Cabildo Abierto was attended by over two million people. Ooh. So the exchange between Evita and the crowd of two million became, for a time, a genuine and spontaneous dialogue with the crowd cheering, Evita, vice president. And when Evita asked for more time so she could make up her mind, the crowd demanded would say... Now, Evita, now. All right, so, at least four days. No, no! I do not renounce my work. I only renounce the honors. No! Oh, my God, it's Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> okay, I don't it's want... Arnold Schwarzenegger in the same <laughs> I believe his name is Wolfgang something. Love this. <laughs> okay. Uh, you just said now, I don't want any worker in my country to be without a response when the resentful, the mediocre people who never understood me, nor never will, who believe that everything I do is for personal gain. No. <laughs> one Rick day. Existed. One day. No. Two hours. No. <laughs> I leave the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> she literally like had to walk away um wow yeah this oh is, my god they just could not give her any moments of peace um she stood there for a minute she thought about how she felt and she looked out at the masses and they were all there demanding a reply so she took the microphone again and said friends as General Perone said, I will do as the people ask. Well, mm, all right. Yeah. She has to die in office. She concluded by promising them an answer in a few days as time on her radio show. Um, she concluded by promising them an answer in a few days time on her radio show. The whole time Juan stood behind her, physically holding her up. Mm. When she finished, she turned and collapsed into his arms in tears. It oh. was to be her last public speech. Oh, that sounds like it took every ounce of her strength. Yeah. She ultimately declined running for vice president. She said her only ambition was that in the large chapter of history, 
to be written about her husband, the footnotes would mention a woman who brought the hopes and dreams of the people to the president. Hmm. A woman who eventually turned those hopes and dreams into, quote, glorious reality. This would become known as the renunciation speech. Ah. Oh. A few months later, Ava went, underwent radical hysterectomy in an attempt to slow the advance of the cancer. She may have also had a prefrontal lobotomy to ease the pain at that point. That doesn't sound like it's easing the pain. <sighs> Apparently it relieves a lot of pressure Imagine to exist. having a fucking wine corkscrew jammed up your nose. That's what a lobotomy is. No, it's an ice pick through your eye. Yeah, actually. it's the ice pick well, through the eye. Either either way. Good God. Yeah, that one's gonna go to your no, sinuses. No, the corkscrew goes to, to get brain. out, like, strokes and shit. Like, they gotta go in and, like, uh, unlodge that little clot. Don't, don't poke my brain. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, that's a great rule. Just don't poke my brain. <laughs> don't touch it. Just don't touch it. it don't touch it. Awful. Don't touch it. So... For anyone who's wondering, she is still 32 at this point. <gasps> She's so young! On her 33rd birthday, Argentine Congress named her, quote, the spiritual leader of the nation. And that spring, she also started undergoing chemotherapy. Fuck's sake, dude. Yeah. Oh my god, 1950s chemotherapy? Scary, yep. scary, scary. It was a radical treatment. <laughs> nah, after that lobotomy, scary. she was fine. <laughs> hey, we're just gonna jam some gamma rays right all in everywhere. Whatever. I can't even feel it. Go ahead. Whatever. You do this. I'm fine. Uh-huh. Yeesh. The cancer had progressed too far, though. Oh, no. Uh, the hysterectomy hadn't been enough, and mm-hmm. neither was the chemo. Cool. So, on June 4th, 1952, Ava joined her husband in his victorious ride through the city. He had just been re-elected as president. Mm -hmm. And, of course, what should people do for any reason fucking ever? Try to tear them down. You fix a parade. Yeah. You make a parade through the entire fucking town. Oh. And have everyone come out and clog up the goddamn streets. Yeah. Literally, in Seattle, it's like, there are just dozens of fucking parades up and down 4th oh. Avenue and you gotta figure out which days you can even bother to drive in that city yeah, it's horrible you sound like an old white republican being mad about parades <laughs> being mad about parades I could give a fuck about parades I don't like lots of people around me I and like they're all stepping on my toes and I just and had this conversation with somebody I want I my personal like, space you okay. being mad about a gay parade sounds pretty gay. Like, the, that's the gayest thing I think about. <laughs> I'm not mad now. about any gay parades. You're In mad, fact, I like, but I'm just saying, I like, like gay parades. You being mad. That's the only one like I the, go to. The context was the Pride Parade. So it's like, <laughs> ah, the gays in their parade. I'm like, but you know what's pretty gay is you being mad about a parade. Like, that's pretty gay. As somebody who attended. Uh, yeah, yeah. Which is fine. That's literally the only parade in a year that I will go to. I'll skip Christmas. I'll skip Thanksgiving. I don't give a fuck about July Fourth. I just find the irony hilarious. Yeah, Pride is kind of. I want to go and have have... rainbows and go. Everybody's in such a good mood and well, it's let's go do fun. the parade and give yeah. our support. And, yeah, yeah. Do you hate All fun? That. That's exactly. Do you hate fun? Yeah. Do you hate fun? Like do you I hate love... day drinking and like really enjoying yeah. give like me being a... fashionable for a day. Yeah. Give me a food <laughs> festival. I'll shut down oh, any yeah. city for a food. Listen, festival. Listen, if it's gonna be a rip, I want a float. Show me the float. <laughs> Show me the float. We all float. Any respectable parade has a few floats. <laughs> Scary movies aren't my thing, but I do know pop culture, so I understand. <gasps> we can. I actually wanted to do a thing where I was going to say, who would we have play her? But, of course, we know who plays her. Who plays uh, Ava. Oh, yeah. Obviously. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, but we definitely should have that as a general Yeah, who thing, would we sure. recast today? Anyway. Ooh, that's a good question. Yeah. I would say Lady Gaga. Oh my god. Fucking Lady Gaga. Lady Gaga. Hands goddamn down. Absolutely would embody Ava Perone. As long as it's better than House of Gucci, because that was terrible. <laughs> yeah. I've never seen it. I, I felt very Don't awkward bother. watching that with my parents, and I'm like, okay. They go from having... Never mind. I'm not yeah, yeah, we'll get to that later. I don't want to. Anyway, that's we're the after pod. Parades. Yeah, that's not what this is for. We're doing a parade. Mm-hmm. So, we're doing a parade. Wholesome parades. <laughs> By this time, Ava weighed 80 pounds. Oh my god, she, how tall was she? She was she was short, but she was never that skinny. This was the skinniest she was. That's still so skinny for somebody even at four. She ten. was unable to stand for more than a few seconds at a time. Yes, I oh god. Die. So she took three doses of painkillers and that was like the good <gasps> shit at the time. Like not USDA regulated. Like not yeah, no. FDA. This is just regulated you know shit. somebody like good, who has a plan. No, this is presidential Argentine shit. It's a yeah. horse tranquilizer. Yeah, uh, basically. She took three of them. Oh my god. And then she was strapped into a wire stand uh, that was made for her. She put a coat on. 
Okay. And no one was the wiser. She's like oh. Bizarre World FDR. She, literally, kinda. she's no, she's fucking JFK, but like in a metal like hoop stand okay. thing. And like as if, if no took, one knows she can stand on her own. It's yeah, kinda, she's trying to make it seem like she can stand. Like she still it's has like the strength to do that. Right. Oh. It wasn't even the walker. It's literally like a, just a crutch. Yeah, so a she podium. Kinda, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, she she was in like the whole parade nice. and it took another two doses of painkillers when they got home because it was hours and oh. hours that they went through the city on this thing dedicated if her health had been declining rapidly before it was crashing now. oh well yeah because she's not taking care of herself well she is well she like, is and she's not she cancer. is but there's also kind of a lost cause it's yeah, like it's cancer getting well, you. It's, it's cancer well, but that yeah. type of public like she wants to do as much of, good before she's... It takes it on. Like, you're already going through chemo. You already don't have the She's energy. been burning guess, herself at both ends for yeah. years and years, and the thought of slowing down now, where this pesky little cancer is well, taking me, like, It's not even pesky little... I, I, I almost imagine that she's like, I'm on my way out. I'm just going to fucking burn it as hard as I can and then be done when I'm done. I guess I didn't think about that there. I'd be like, dude, I'm just going to take painkillers and sleep. <laughs> yeah. But no, I. She's got a cause. She, she's got a yeah, cause. Yeah, she's got that drive. That's yeah. why we love her. She wanted to be there and be square about all of her people. And yeah, what's yeah. your purpose in life? <laughs> <laughs> to survive. Not fucking sad. that. Yeah, not fucking yeah. that. Nah, not trying to. I don't know if I have enough charisma like she does. So we're about to hear kind of a little bit of a. This is sad. Okay. So we're losing her charisma. She's losing her shine. She's got this advanced cancer. Oh no. She's eighty pounds. She can't stand. She's right. confined to her bed. So she would have her servants wear her designer clothing for her mm-hmm. and come in and like kind of parade around. Nice, for her. the original body double. Yeah. Oh. And she would just weep and weep over her lost health oh. and beauty. Like she would just get so sad at the fact that she was dying and that she wasn't beautiful and young like she was. No. Because that's that not was the case. It, it is it wasn't the case, but like she loved so much yeah. that she was this beautiful woman who had done all of these good things and now she can't even stand up. Yeah. No, that she would be She can't so wear any hard. of her pretty dresses. She can't wear her jewelry. She can't wear her anything. It was dying. Mm. And it's real sad. And you sound so sad about it. <laughs> it is. It's real sad. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's real sad. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, but it is. No, like if I let myself get any more emotionally attached to it, like I will tear up. Oh, it's really okay. fucking sad. Like the whole nation, mm-hmm. there's like outside her, outside the palace, they're keeping vigil. Yeah. They've got like the candle lights. They've got the little like, uh, some little like pictures yeah. and stuff yeah. of her little... all over the place. Yeah, she's essentially the queen of Argentina. Yes, very much so. And they're mm-hmm. keeping vigil 24-7 outside of Cato, oh, wow. outside of the castle. Quote, If life is a continual choice and we continue to evolve until the hour of our death, then on July 26, 1952, Evita, the child born 33 years ago in a small Argentine town, had reached the end of her journey. She mm-hmm. had become forever Evita. So that announcement was... Mm-hmm taken across the whole nation. The press secretary's office of the presidency of the nation fulfills its very sad duty to inform the people of the Republic that at 2025 hours, Mrs. Eva Peron, spiritual leader of the nation died. Mm. They interrupted everything for this. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, Argentines were beside themselves. The Casa Rosada ordered government work suspended for two days. All flags were to be at half mass for 10 days. It wasn't enough when they moved mm. her body to the department of labor building, which was like, miles away eight people were crushed in the, to death in the throngs of the mourners oh mm-hmm. shit so by july 27th they got stampeded they got Damn. stampeded that's horrible by july 27th every flower shop in buenos aires was completely empty they shipped in flowers from all over the country and internationally piles and piles of flowers lined the street for weeks oh wow. by july 28th the very next day 2000 would be attended to for injuries from the crowds and 2000 more were treated directly in the streets so, if you weren't getting treated in the street, you were going to actually see a doctor. Mm-hmm. For two weeks, people lined up outside the labor building for city blocks to have an opportunity to pay their respects to this body that was interred in a glass case. Mm-hmm. Um, she was given a state funeral, even though she'd never held an official state title. The Catholic Church held a full requiem mass for her. Wow. So, if you guys were Catholic, you know mm-hmm. what a big yeah. deal that is. Yeah. Sounds like a nightmare. Yeah, this is fucking crazy. And there were just people mass. everywhere. After two weeks, they moved her body to another building and paraded through the city for one last day of viewing. 
Juan was devastated. Although two full weeks had been allotted to public mourning, people needed more. Mm -hmm. Perone arranged to have Ava's body preserved, so plans were drawn up and construction started for a memorial and a tomb. Mm -hmm. Like, same, kind of combined. It would be a dedication to the Descamisados that she dedicated so much of her life to. So all the laborers that she, like, just really loved, Mm -hmm. she wanted to be able to kind of Everyone can come and pay their respects as, like, a mecca, yeah. if you want to. Yeah. Forevermore. Yeah. Um, like a shrine. Yeah, it was, basically. Yeah. yeah. But it was never finished. Uh, Juan Perón fled... Still? Argen- to this day? Yep. What? So, Perón had to flee Argentina in 1955. He was forced out by another military coup. Oh. He had to leave without Ava's body. And the dictatorship that took over... Uh-oh. Sent her to Italy and buried her under the name Maria Magi. Why? Because okay. they didn't want her body. They didn't want this, like, yeah. corpse that they'd been looking at for years, like, just sitting out there. They just were yeah. like, all right, let's get rid of it. So let's go send it to Italy since that's where Perón yeah. went. So in 1971, she was exhumed and taken to Juan's home in mm-hmm. Spain. Okay. Where he set her up in the dining room. Oh, when Juan was released from exile and returned home in 1973, he regained office. He died in 1974. His third wife displayed Ava and Juan together for a while, and then Ava's body was taken from the Duarte tomb. There was this weird body hostage situation, and she was returned to Buenos Aires. Like, she got stolen. Yeah. And then she was held hostage for a while. But then she was returned to Buenos Aires and, like, literally just kind of dumped out in the street. What? For people to, like, find her fucking corpse. Wow. It was crazy. So today she's buried under layers, literal layers and layers of protection. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Um, quote, in all of Latin America, only one other woman has aroused an emotion, devotion, and faith comparable to those awakened by the Virgin of Guadalupe. In many homes, the image of Evita is on the wall next to the Virgin. Wow. From Fabienne Rousseau Lenoir. Wow. She had such a connection with the people to the point where they want her next to they're saints well yeah. also yeah. like not only her cancer but then like the disrespect of her dead body <gasps> yeah, yeah that's appalling it makes her me. like a, then repeated disrespect of her body right. what it, it makes hell? her like a martyr to the third power mm-hmm. and i guess i'm wondering why they named it maria magi it was like so that it didn't immediately get dug up in italy oh, so they changed the name okay. so that she could kind of have a little anonymity they sent it undercover trying to hide it right witness or not witness, like, but hey like, motherfuckers important, corpse protection, important corpse protection, corpse protection pro- program yeah corpse protection program <laughs> wow yikes pass what a badass to the yeah. point i mean like just never stopped and it's just i sit here going and i get overwhelmed by too many people online at the yeah, store people hate you so much they're willing to fuck your body up <laughs> Yep. God, okay, yeah, I don't want that. Yeah, she dedicated her entire life, like, when she actually became someone, she dedicated her entire life to all of the people that she was. Yeah. That she once was, that she had to come from. She knew how fucked up things were down there. Viva Evita. Yep, may Lady Gaga play her in an amazing retelling. Who do you think um, Che would be? Ooh. I don't know. What do you guys think? I haven't really thought about it. I mean, I'd love to see Pedro Pascal play somebody. <sighs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Anyone? Just <clears throat> keep him on the screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just, you know, he's been working a lot. He's doing a lot of, like, little ads. He's enjoying his... Pedro, moment. please listen to this and love us because you're... Manifest adorable it. Adorable and wonderful and you're a great actor. No, and he would absolutely support Evita. Oh, fuck yeah. Yeah. Actually, you know what? He would make a really good shake. He would have to shave the mustache. Oh. But, I mean, he would look good without it. I know that. But that's but like, he's famous. It is very famous. Have it's you ever like. Seen pictures of him, like, from, like, way back in the day on, like, Law and Order? Like, oh, young, yeah. Punk, no. Like, yeah. I didn't see him as punk. I saw him on Buffy. He was on an episode of Buffy oh, yeah. the Vampire Slayer. And he played just like this guy who ends up getting turned into a vampire later. And it's just, I didn't recognize him. Yeah, I didn't recognize him until somebody's like, no, that's Pedro Pascal. And I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, what the fuck? We watched this episode of Hot Ones. And yeah, he, does mm-hmm. Hot Ones. he does a thing on Hot Sean Ones. And he Evans, talks about... Sean you a what up, boy? Oh, right. Oh. He, he does this bit where he's talking about being on that episode of Law and Order where he has to play golf. And he's just like making shit up. And like, mm-hmm. oh, that's Makes funny. up a whole fucking language, like, just on the spot. Yeah. Oh, really? Just yeah. babbling. It's babble. 
I'm gonna have to it, watch he makes this. it sound like he's putting a goddamn curse on you. Yeah, that's exactly that. That's the episode about. I remember yeah. him from. I will have to check that out because I have not seen that yet. He's got like spiky hair and eyeliner on. And that's crazy. Clean shaven. <laughs> and he looks. He's got like a leather vest on with no sleeves. It's beautiful. <laughs> that's insane to me. I, I just I don't see him with no mustache. It's, I know. <laughs> I just It's a little know. hard, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he is an infant. You can see how young he is. Oh, yeah. At the time. Really? Yeah, oh, it's a young Pedro Pascal. Really? Oh, yeah. Really? Really? I don't want to say that that way. <laughs> I love it. Where do I like, get that? It almost sounds like... Really? <laughs> really? <laughs> oh, really? That's funny. <sighs> All right, anyway, so okay. that's, uh, that's Evita, and this is our yeah. rough draft take. Yeah, part one. Very well behaved. Yep. Very, yeah, well behaved. And this is, I mean, it's going to be everything from well behaved as in like she, it's, you know, she introduced institutional change into like the nation to she killed a bunch of people um, mm. to everything in between. So sweet. Yeah. Yes. Kind of excited about it. All right. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much for sticking around. And this has been a fucking podcast. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye.